Thank you. Um, yeah, so I bought this new Bible reading book by a guy called Tim Keller. He's a theologian and author. And on the first day, um, this really struck to me, struck me, and really hit me um, as the the stuff that he was talking about about peace. So I'm going to talk about peace, but that also references quite a lot of where our songs took us today as well. So I can't remember how to use the clicker. So it's just like arrow right, yeah? Hey, look, it works. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to read from the most famous um, verse on peace, Philippians 4, and I'm reading from 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's a big claim, isn't it? His peace will guard our hearts and our minds. So, in this Bible study thing that I was reading, Terry hasn't stolen it yet. I did give it away on day five, just but I had to buy another one. But <laughs> yeah, a little hand up at the back. It wasn't to Terry, it was to Joy at the back. I just thought it was a really good thing. And the Hebrew word for this perfect, the, the Hebrew word shalom, we call peace, okay? And he said there's a big difference between our word peace and the word shalom. The Hebrew word for perfect, harmonious, big word, interdependence among all parts of creation, everything, perfect and harmonious amongst everything is shalom. And we go, peace. And then he went on to say, but the English word peace is basically negative. And I was like, is it? Is it negative? And this is why he said it was. He said, um, that our English word peace is usually referring to an absence or trouble, an absence of trouble, an absence of hostility, an absence of something, and that's what brings peace. And I think that that's what we do think, isn't it? So a peace is when we haven't got anything bad going on. When I was thinking of peace, and this might be because I was a 70s girl who watched a lot of TV, I got thinking, and it was always Miss World. Anyone seen Miss World ever? She always wanted world peace. And I thought, standing there in your cosy love, with your high heels on, wearing a crown that's falling off, isn't like, probably not your best career choice for peace. But I know, mean, mean. Um, but anyway, I don't know why I called her love in the middle, that was mean. But our English word peace is usually referring to this absence of trouble or hostility. But this Hebrew word peace, is so much more. The peace of God, this is what Keller wrote, he's cleverer than me, so I'm going to read his words. The peace of God is not the absence of fear, it in fact is his presence. The peace of God is not the absence of fear, it in fact is his presence. So an in, the peace of God is an in, not an out. That's me being a bit more simplistic than Tim Keller. The peace of God is him in, not the stuff out. Oh, I'm a bit late with my clicker. The Bible tells us that we can lose this peace. How? How do we lose this peace if it's an in from God? The Bible tells us that through sin, through being far away from God, or even when we just look at other things not God. So it doesn't feel that sinful, but it's just not God. That's when we don't get the peace in the same way. So sin isn't just doing bad things, it's putting good things in place of God. So when we decide to serve ourselves, when we decide to be self-centered, all of those things, when, when, when we become our God, that's when our peace kind of goes. I don't know whether we relate. I mean, I do. I know when I'm taking things into my own hands. So how do we know God's supernatural peace? How can we kind of reorientate? How can we kind of fix our eyes back? How can we restore this peace? So this is the 
phrases that he used. He's saying that a supernaturally changed heart is what we're looking for versus us trying to obtain, kind of gripping our teeth, <laughs> a morally restrained, kind of doing the right thing kind of life. Now, I'm not saying don't do that. Just don't, don't mishear me. But if that's the only way we're trying to get peace, we're going to fall because we're just trying to do it ourselves. Trying to control and suppress the difficulties that we have all by ourselves, funnily enough, we're not very good at that. But we need to be talking to God about it. We need to be asking for his guidance, his peace. Maybe we're not doing either of those things, but we are pretending that the things causing us a problem aren't really there. Anyone ever been good at pretending? Burying our heads as if it's not there. Something's upset me, something bad has happened, something in my life isn't like I would like it to be. So rather than go there with God, rather than try and control it myself, what I'm going to do is bury my head right here, pretend it's not happening, sing la 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 la, and then it will go. Anyone been there? I mean, you might sing a different tune. Don't know. Well, sad to say, that doesn't work either, does it? Doesn't work. It might, it might feel like it's working for a while, but that is not peace. The absence of the thing, either by trying really hard to do things on our own or pretending it's not there, isn't bringing peace. Only the in, the supernatural peace of God, brings us this kind of peace. And it's a peace that's different to any other kind of peace. God's peace isn't just peace. It's God's peace in us. Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. They're just some. When we've got the Holy Spirit in us, these things come out of us because he's topped us up with them. He's the one that's given us them. Our behavior changes. Our hearts respond to that Holy Spirit changing in us. Is this right? Our hearts change as the Holy Spirit's working in us. So what's the opposite of God's peace? Those words have come up time and time again in our worship today. Anxiety and fear. And we're not, we're not exempt from those things. Any of us in this room can have felt anxious and can have felt fear. But it's a serious, it's serious to feel those things. Some people call it anxiety when it's just a genuine concern about family and stuff. But that anxiety, that debilitating sense of I cannot do this is a massive, massive issue in our culture, isn't it? It's a massive issue for all of us. If we feel anxiety and fear and debilitating worry, we have not got or sustained by, we're not holding on to God's peace. Is that right? Verse 6 of our reading today says, do not be anxious about anything. That's quite an instruction, isn't it? But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your rest request to God. So don't be anxious about it. Easier said than done. The fact is, it is mentioned, says that it's a thing though. The fact that this, don't be anxious. The Bible's not just saying, don't do that thing that no one has. The Bible's saying, don't be anxious because people do get anxious. So we're talking about something that does happen, but don't be anxious, but in every situation, prayer, thanksgiving, and request to God. Okay, so if we do that, then what happens? And the peace, the antidote comes. When we come to God, the peace of God, which transcends, trumps, is over, everything, all the words we can think about that is, over all of our understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Your name is power, we were saying today. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Your name. He breaks the strongholds. Some of us here today have faced the worst situations that anyone can face. Some of us haven't even talked about those things. Some of us have been cruising along in life and bang, something happens and it changes everything. Our whole worlds change. The human response, the way we could imagine that we would respond would be total devastation. Inability to cope at all. And some of us have been in very dark places, but no chance of ever getting through. 
The natural is to feel exposed and vulnerable and want time to just hide away, right? When those sort of things happen. But let's, but God says that my peace is over and above our understanding, over and above. Let's remember that his peace is what gets us through. It's not just because we've done a good job. It's not just because we're not thinking about it, burying it, hiding away from it. It's because God is doing his thing in us. So let's just read the next scriptures in that same passage. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at least that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be con uh, content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every, any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So Paul says, he really does say, he's the same in all circumstances. Content in every situation, like an equilibrium of his state of mind, a balanced state. How? Through Christ who strengthened him. Not because he is some kind of superhuman, but through Christ who strengthened him. So rather than gritting our teeth and getting on with it or burying our heads and pretending it's not there, how, how can we, what's our, I mean, let's just think for a second, what's our culture say about this concept of having to have peace as a result, as a, you know, in response to loads of tough stuff going on. We spend loads, loads of money in our culture trying to get an equilibrium. There must be an issue, otherwise we wouldn't be spending our money on it. People don't spend their money on stuff that isn't a thing. We spend lots of money making sure we're doing okay. And that can be anything. It can be stuff like gym membership and healthy fad diets, me time, Netflix or therapists. It can be anything at all, but it's a bit of, I, I, need, to, I need to make sure that I'm okay. My work-life balance is a massive, massive thing in our culture, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with any of these things and we're doing them because there is an issue. And we do need to make sure our minds are okay as well as our bodies. But finances, family, sadness, concerns, complications, health, anything like that, the list can keep going on. These things are sometimes very, very, very hard for us and we're not sure how we get through them. And what Paul is saying is, I'm content in all of those circumstances, whichever ones we're talking about. That his life stays the same and balanced. And I'm like, well, good for you. Good for you, Paul. I mean, that's my cynical response when I read that. I'm like, well, great. Great. Thanks. Thanks for right. Thank, thanks, God, for keeping that one in the Bible. Thank you. Thank you for that. How terribly good. But, and there is a but. I like to say and, don't I, Haley? And we can all know that same peace. God's peace. Actually, Paul was not in a good place. He wasn't having an easy time of it when he wrote that. Practically, life was not handing him a good deal. His life was tough and it wasn't just an easy, simple time for him. He was in prison and he was facing death and torture. I would say that's a tricky time. Death and torture was his going to be his lot. And he's like, I'm the same in every circumstance. But it wasn't just an absence of fear. He wasn't some kind of loon. It wasn't just because he had a good work-life balance either. It was the peace of God. The peace of God. Christian peace. This kind of peace enables us to face facts properly. And it lifts us up and over any circumstance. 
any circumstance. So we're not under those circumstances. And sometimes we do feel like it, we are, don't we? Sometimes we feel like we're sitting under a heavy load. And if we're today feeling like we're sitting under a heavy circumstance, I heard this challenge once and I'm going to challenge us today. What are we doing under there? It's not our place to be. We're not under it. We're over it in Jesus. His peace, his grace gives us an over the circumstances place in our heart, a peace in our heart. So, what can we do to know God's supernatural peace? I've written two words there. Thinking and thanking. And it's from the scripture, I'm just going to highlight the scripture. Thinking, thinking about what? Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, the good stuff. If we want peace, we think about God. We think about who he is. We think about what he says to us. We think about the truth. It's not often that we think, you know what, doctrine, that's what's going to see me through. The doctrine of the word of God, actually the truth of the word of God is what sees us through. We think about these things. Imagine going to a therapist. I mean, I don't think this happens. Imagine going to a therapist and say, I'm a got all these problems. And they say, I don't actually want to hear about your problems. I want to ask you some questions. Can we start by having some thinking time? I want us to think about life. I want you to think about what is truth. I want you to think, where do we come from? What's the bigger picture? And we would do a runner, wouldn't we? Because we want to go to be sorting out our stuff. But actually here, one of the ways we get God's peace is to think. To think about the bigger picture, not only think about the situation we're in, but think about the one who will see us through it. Think about the one who lifts us out of it. Think about who he is. Thanking, thinking and thanking. I found a fact. Did you know that the Stoics in ancient Greece, so it's a long time ago, sorry for those of you who find this really boring, it's time for the teenagers to wake up because I'm talking about Stoics. No, <laughs> Stoics in ancient Greek, they taught that most people cannot live a life of equilibrium. You cannot do it. They say this is because we love the wrong things. Okay, so they said this. Sounds okay, because actually we do love the wrong things, so how do we get peace if we're loving the wrong things? But their view of what the wrong things were, were a little bit off. Their view of things that they said we couldn't love were family. Can't love your family, because if you love your family, then your heart will get broken. And so we must just give our hearts to ourselves, because that's the only thing that we can control. So set our hearts on me, on yourself. And they were big, they became big in ancient Greece. And then there was this amazing um, monk called Augustine who has said some amazing things. And he kind of said, codswallop. I think that was a direct translation from the Latin. He said, he pointed out that their own contentment and success and their virtue, well, we can't control that either. So you can't control yourself either. So there's no sense of truth in this. But actually, how much have we been sold a lie in our culture? How much is this true that we are looking to serve ourselves and then we'll be better? How much are we trying to do that? And how much do we as Christians kind of go along with that a bit? So this Augustine guy in the 16th century stepped out and said, he went as far as this. And he was talking to a culture that really wasn't saying this. God loves each of us as if there was only one of us. So it's only in him that we get that kind of love. We can't even love ourselves that well. The reality is God treated Jesus like all of us deserve. That's where the battle was won. He got the consequences of all of us. Jesus lost his peace because he said, why have you forsaken me, God? But he didn't lose it just by accident or for no reason. He lost it so that we can have our eternal peace. He lost that peace for that moment so that we can gain peace in him. 
So this takes us to the other one, thanking. Verse 6 says, make our request to God with thanksgiving. Make our request to God with thanksgiving. So can you do X, Y, and Z, please, God? And then you thank him after when he's delivered? No, it doesn't seem like that. It seems here that we say thank you as we ask. Thank you for who he is. Thank you for what he does. Thank you for his goodness. Thank you for the truth of his word as we bring our request to him. Romans 8 verse 28 says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Even terrible things that happen, like we talked about right at the beginning, even the terrible things that happen to us, God works for good. This could, is this just wishful thinking? No. God works the most awful situations for good. I was thinking the other day when the followers, when Jesus' followers were looking at him when he was dying on the cross, how could they have thought anything else other than what on earth has just happened? Like we were going somewhere with this guy. This guy was surely God. And now he's died. Like all of those promises, all of those hopes, they didn't get the next bit, did they? They were just watching someone die in front of them that they knew was God. So then all of the questions that would have come up, surely they'd have thought that that was the worst day in history. The worst day. And it was a terrible day, but it was also the best day. And the thing is, God knew the whole picture, didn't he? Because God does that. He knows the whole picture. The trouble with us is we don't know, and we like to know. So when we think we're going through the worst ever thing, it is the worst ever thing, because we know. Well, actually, God knows other things that we don't know. It doesn't mean that that wasn't a terrible thing, but he does know how he's going to turn it for good. God turns things for good. Are we thankful even when we don't know? It's a harder one, isn't it? Faith. Faith takes us there. When we've seen situations before, when we remember stories that have gone before, when we remember in our own lives when we've had the peace of God, even when we really shouldn't have, those things build our faith that when we go through a really tough time again, God will bring his peace. And it's in him we get our peace. It wasn't a good idea to crucify Jesus. Bad move. But it was the best time for the history of the universe that he died and rose again. Maybe we don't see the good, but we can be thankful for what we do know. Thinking and thanking. I think I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to pray. Somebody get the kids, please. Thank you, God, for your supernatural ability to change our hearts. Thank you that in you, peace happens that's an in from you, and we don't have to be taking out all of the stuff that gets in the way. But in you, in your peace, we see the stuff that's in the way. And we choose to get away, get rid of it anyway. But thank you that your peace comes because we call on you. Your peace comes when we are thinking about you above the situation. When we thank you, whether we know it or not. When we thank you because you are good. So today I just want to thank you for who you are. Come Holy Spirit. We're calling on you for those debilitating states of anxiety and fear, uncontrollable worry, times when we're trying to do it on our own because we think we should. Father, would you come into those times? And for anyone sitting here today who's just got their head completely buried in the sand, singing la la la, Father, come in power. Send your spirit and bring your peace. For those of us who have never, ever known your peace, I pray you will come in power today. I pray that anything that sits in the way will be highlighted by you and that you will come and you will bring your supernatural presence. Thank you for your scripture. Thank you for your truth. 
Thank you that time and time again you have come in power into what seemed like a hopeless place and you have turned it for good. And I pray for anyone struggling right now that they would see your hope, see your goodness, see your truth, that they would know by the presence of your spirit and enjoy your peace, your presence, your thankfulness, your gratefulness in their heart because they know you. Lord, in your mercy, come in power, we pray. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of things to say.